everyone welcome back to my channel so we're gonna work on the last 10 questions of this paper so for question 31 in an electric circuit 40 coulombs of electric charge pass a point in five seconds so 40 coulombs five seconds now when you have charge and you have time you can use this formula right here and we're looking for current so we're going to rearrange it for i which is uh, current so that would be I is equal to Q over T, right? So simply substitute the values in there. So 40 C over 5.0 S, which gives you 8.0 amperes. All right, so that would be B. Now for question 32, there is a current of five amperes in a resistor, okay? The potential difference across the resistor is 24 volts. How much energy is transferred in the resistor in one minute? So we're asking for energy. All right, so we have these little triangles that we can use. We have P is equal to E divided by T. We have your I is equal to P divided by V. Now, our goal is energy. We have current and we have voltage and we have time, but we're trying to get power. And in order to get that, or sorry, we're trying to get, yeah, power. So in order to get that, power is current times voltage, okay? Now, now that we have power, we need energy, and energy is power times time. So energy is power times time, and we know that power is current times voltage, right? Times time. Okay, now we substitute those values in here. So current is 5 amperes times the voltage, which is 24, times the time, which is not one minute, but 60 seconds. We have to keep it in the standard un units um, in order to get the right answer, and that would be 7,200 joules. So with the these type of questions, I definitely suggest keeping a formula sheet or uh, well, you're not allowed to have a formula sheet with you, but you can create one and use it as practice, and soon enough you'll memorize all the formulas that you need during the exam. So for question 33, the diagram shows a circuit, and switch S is closed, so this switch right here. Which lamp lights up? All right, let's see. We close this, and we have here diodes, which um, restrict the movement to one direction only. So we're going this way, we enter here. Okay, let's look at the first one. Um, we go this way and we can go through. So lamp one is a yes. We try lamp two and then, well, we're stuck here. We can't really pass. So lamp two is not going to open and the only option would be lamp one. So your answer is A. So just, um, when you have a die, just remember it kind of it looks like an arrow, so you kind of follow it in that direction, right? Okay. So for 34, a circuit contains four ammeters, okay, and three resistors with different values. Which ammeter shows the largest reading? Okay, so this is a parallel circuit. So that means that the current is divided so let me write that down, current divided um, into each branch. So we have current, some going in here, some going in here, some going in here. So if we want the total current, it's going to be what's added up near the end. So if we have this that goes back here, and this adds up here, this adds up here, then boom, D would be your answer because this is the ammeter that will collect all the current near the end. Because what you have coming out would be what you have coming in, right? Um, so yeah, even if you didn't know which direction to uh, have the arrows point, it doesn't matter. Because D is the only one that has A outside of the branches, alright? Okay, so for 35, the diagram shows pairs of circuits containing logic gates. Okay, in which diagram does the lower circuit of the pair not behave in the same way as the upper circuit? Okay, I got this table from online, um, you can definitely use this, but again, 
if it's not there for you during the exam, so make sure you're practicing enough um, before moving into your actual exam. So if you check A, um, that is an inverter, right? So the top is an inverter. If you put in a zero, you'll get a one, for example. And then for the bottom part, it's, it's a NAND, right? If you give them zeros on both sides, that will give you a one. So that is correct. So um, if you notice here, they're connected into one. So you're only going to get one value. Whereas here, your inputs, there's two inputs, but you don't need two inputs because it separates into two. So you can have an input of zero and it'll give you a one. So A is the same. You do that for the other options and you'll find that D is the only one that's different. So we have an AND here. Okay, so if you put a zero and a zero, it gives you zero, all right? And then if we look down here, we have a NOR and an inverter. So in this NOR, if we gave it two zeros, okay, it gives us a one, all right? And then from that one, um, in the inverter, it gives us a zero. Okay, so in this case, it acts the same so we have to be careful. So what we're going to do is use zero and one instead of just zeros or just ones. So in the end, when you have a zero and a one, then that gives you a zero. So for the nor, um, I have a zero and one, and that gives me a zero. And then in the inverter, that zero becomes a one. So that's how you know it's not the same. So D is your answer. So that's something to be, you know, careful about. All right, so for 36, the current in a coil produces a magnetic field around it as shown. The magnitude of the potential difference across the coil is increased and its direction is reversed. Okay, so potential difference increased and then direction is reversed. I don't know if that's a good sign for reverse, but yeah, we're just going to assume that means reverse. Okay. So what happens to the magnetic field lines? The lines become closer together. That is factual. So because we're increasing the potential difference, the lines are going to come closer together. So options C and D are gone. Now, which side is the north and which is the south? So the north side is the side that has the arrows moving outwards, right? and the south would have them moving in. So this was the original north side and this is the original south side. But because we reversed it, this became the new north and this is the new south. So the right hand end becomes the south pole and this is our right hand side. So yes, that's correct. A is your answer. So for 37, the notation, of an, the notation for an isotope of sodium is given here. Which row gives the composition of a neutral atom of this isotope of sodium? Now, neutral obviously means that we need equal numbers of protons and electrons, right? So everything that is not equal should be gone. That would be B. All right, so let's see what's next. Um, number of protons it says here 12, which is wrong because we have the atomic number at the bottom here, and that is 11. And the atomic number gives us the number of protons and electrons in a neutral atom. So the number of neutrons would be the mass number minus the atomic number. So 23 minus 11, which equals to 12. So then our only option is A. Now, for 38, the radioactive isotope of hydrogen undergoes beta decay to the isotope 3,2 helium. What is the nuclide notation for the hydrogen isotope? Okay, so a beta particle is emitted when a neutron turns into a proton emitting an electron. So a note, the electron is created at the moment of the decay. It is not present in the, neutral, in the neutron beforehand. Okay, how did I get the answer C? So we started with this helium, 3, 2. We know here, based off of the statement that the neutron would transform into a proton emitting an electron. 
So if we want to go in reverse to get our original answer, we're going to add a neutron. That is, we're removing a proton and an electron. So then we'll have an atomic number of one because we removed a proton and only hydrogen has that. And then, yes, we removed a proton, but we did end up with a neutron, right? So then the overall mass number is the same because we know that mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. If we subtracted a proton but added a neutron, then it's just equal to zero and it cancels out. So then C is our answer, right? Now we continue. So when measuring the emission from a radioactive rock brought into the laboratory, a teacher mentions that background radiation, background radiation must be taken into account. So what is background radiation? This is a general, this is just generally what you're supposed to know. Background radiation is the ionizing radiation in the, lab in the laboratory when the radioactive rock is not present. So it's just the regular uh, radioactivity that's going on in the background when that rock isn't actually there. Hence why it's called background radiation. So you need to take into account that and in order to get the radiation of the actual rock, you would subtract background radiation from your readings. Okay, so for the last question, solid cesium 137 decays by the emission of beta particle to form solid barium-137. Okay, so we have barium particles, emits gamma rays. Okay, the barium-137 undergoes no further decay. Half-life of cesium-137 is 33 years. A block of pure cesium-137 has a mass of 2 micrograms. The diagram shows the radiation detector a distance of 5 centimeters from the block the detector registers a count of 2,000 counts per second. Okay, so which statement is not correct? Emphasis on not. Okay, let's start with the bottom. Let's start uh, from D and work our way up. So with 2 millimeters of aluminum between the block and the detector, the count rate is reduced significantly. Now, why is that? So when the three types of radiation hit the aluminum, only gamma rays get through. Beta particles can get through paper, but the aluminum stops them. When gamma radiation hits the concrete, the energy is absorbed, so the concrete stops the gamma radiation from escaping. So when we're dealing with only aluminum, um, only the gamma rays are made through, not beta ones, and so the reading would end up decreasing, right? We're not picking up any beta particles. So that means this option is correct, and so it's not the answer because we're looking for what is not correct. Now. With 5 centimeters of lead between the block and the detector, the count rate is just above background level. Now, when you add the block, it, um, it kind of absorbs the gamma radiation as well. So, maybe if you enter and you're just, just above background level. So, that is um, believable and hence true. So, not the answer we're looking for. Now, it says here that after 66 years, the sample contains 1.5 micrograms of barium. Now we have the formula here to find uh, to deal with half-lives. So N is the quantity of the substance remaining and naught is the initial quantity of the substance, T is the time elapsed, and T half is the half-life of the substance. So we're trying to find NT um, after 66 years. So let's just do 66. So the original um, quantity of the substance is 2 micrograms. So micrograms, I'm going to change it to um, regular grams. So that's 2, to the ten, two times 10 to the power of negative 6. Okay, um, then we have a half here. The time, 66, over the half-life, which is 33. And we grab a calculator. It would give me 5 times 10 to the power of negative 7 grams, which is about 0.5 micrograms. So that's how much of 
cesium-137 is left. And initially we had two grams, so two micrograms, my bad. So two micrograms minus 0 0.5 micrograms would mean we have 1.5 micrograms of barium now. Barium-137. So that means it's correct. So then if all of the three options are correct, then that means A is our answer. So it says after 33 years, the mass of the block is one microgram. Based off of the examiner's report, you as the student need to realize that mass that's lost due to beta particles are basically negligible unless the overall mass of the block is virtually the same. So mass of the block would be still two micrograms in general. And then here, the difference is here it's asking for the mass of the block and here it's asking how much of barium is in the sample. All right, so that's everything for this paper. I hope you guys found it useful and I'll see you in my next videos. Bye-bye.